Hi everyone, I'm Gabe Saldivar, pastor of Life Church of Orange, and we're so glad that you could join us today for our Growing in Christ study. Today, we are looking at what Jesus says about where our treasure is, there our heart will be also. You know, it, God is looking for us to be a people who are undivided, not having a divided heart. And what this is speaking to is when our heart uh, is absorbed or consumed with other things than the Lord, where we're seeking other things other than Him, especially when it comes to mammon, when it comes to the love of money, which Jesus says is the root of all evil. So we're looking here at Matthew chapter 6, 19 through 24, and what Jesus is teaching to us, what it looks like to be rich in Him. Okay, so let's uh, start right up here in Matthew chapter 6, verses 19 through 24. It says, Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy, and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The lamp of the body is the eye. If therefore your eye is good, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If therefore the light that is in you is darkness, how great is that darkness? No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. So I'd like you to think about this question. What do you value most in your life? What is it that at the, the, the peak or, or the highest point of the desires of your heart, what do you value the most? What, if you lo what is it that if you lost, um, you couldn't absolutely do without? Uh, is it your family? Is it your possessions? Is it your status or your position in life? After you've been able to answer that question in your heart, as a child of God, does that line up with the things that Jesus values and in his wisdom instructs us to value? What Christ is leading to in this portion of the Sermon on the Mount is that we seek God first and truly that we make him our priority, that we seek him only. Uh, every other relationship expands from here, right? A, a Christian is centered on Christ first, is centered on God first. Everything else uh, comes after that. Spouse, children, family, church, work, school, extended relationships, and so on and so forth. Now, consider what Colossians 3, 1 through 2 says. If then you were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ is sitting at the right hand of God, and set your mind on things above, not on things of the earth. So, what you value reveals what you what's in your heart. This is what Jesus is basically telling us. What you truly value reveals what's going on inside of us, whether we realize it or not. Interestingly, what the Lord wants us to see is where our treasure is. Is it in the Lord or are we interested in satisfying ourselves first? Trust in the Lord only comes when our heart is completely surrendered to him and willfully where we willfully give it to him. Proverbs 3, 5 through 6, you may know this by heart. It says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct your path. That, that is trusting the Lord with not just some of your heart, not just a little bit of your heart, not a part of your heart, but all of your heart. And, and that's where we see uh, we're not leaning on our own thinking, or not leaning on our, our own means of, of making things happen and, and doing it our way but it's actually putting our trust, our complete trust in him where our heart is uh, solely his and, and he directs our path. He makes a way for us. Now, there's an interesting story in the Old Testament. Uh, you may remember King Asa and how he stopped trusting in the Lord even after the Lord had brought a great deliverance. Um, without your heart being loyal to him, we do have a divided heart. You will never fully be able to put your trust in him when you have a divided heart. Let's read 2 Chronicles about King Asa in chapter 16, verses uh, 7 through 9. Uh, this is where the prophetic word came to King Asa. And it says, At that time, Hanani the seer came to Asa, king of Judah, 
and said to him, Because you have relied on the king of Syria and have not relied on the Lord your God, therefore the army of the king of Syria has escaped from your hand. Were the Ethiopians and the Lubim not a huge army with very much chariots and horsemen? Yet because you relied on the Lord, he delivered them into your hand. For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong on behalf of those whose heart is loyal to him. In this you have done foolishly, therefore from now on you shall have wars. You know, it's interesting that the word of God says there uh, that he wants to show himself strong on behalf of those whose hearts are loyal to him or undivided to him or where our hearts are wholly his. Now, King Asa's heart was not loyal to the Lord, even though the Lord had previously delivered him from a million-man army from Ethiopia. There was a million men. They had 300 chariots, it says, and they had a million soldiers that that, uh, the Lord defeated before Asa. He delivered uh, King Asa uh, from this vast army. And now, in this time that they're talking about here, in chapter 16... Uh, It was a much smaller incident, and instead of Asa going to the Lord to trust him, he puts his trust in in man, in in the armies, Uh, and he trusted in the king of Syria to deliver him. So the Lord sees our hearts. We cannot hide our true intentions from him. And to the Pharisees, whom the Bible calls lovers of money, Jesus saw right through them also. In Luke chapter 15, verses 14 through 15, it says this, Now the Pharisees, who were lovers of money, also heard all these things, and they derided him. They derided Jesus. And he said to them, You are those who justify yourselves before men, but God knows your hearts. For what is highly esteemed among men is an abomination in the sight of God. So God's word teaches us that he looks to the heart of man. King David, for example, called a man after God's own heart, said to his son Solomon in 1 Chronicles Uh, chapter 28, verse 9. He says, As for you, my son Solomon, know the God of your father and serve him with a loyal heart and with a willing mind. For the Lord searches all hearts and understands all the intent of the thoughts. If you seek him, he will be found by you. But if you forsake him, he will cast you off forever. You know, and that's important to see as a child of God. If we seek him, right, as we seek him, we will find the living God, just as he has found us in Christ and has saved us and delivered us. But it's also in our obedience, the Lord is looking for us to seek him as well. It's why there's relationship. It's part of having a relationship, growing in him, learning to desire him more and more. Now, Jesus was talking about the eye and and if the eye is good. So how do we make our eye good according to the word of God? If we walk in the light as he is in the light. Let me show you. 1 John chapter 1, verses 5-7 through seven says this, This is the message which we have heard from him and declare to you. This is the message that Jesus taught the apostles. And this is the message that the apostles is de- uh, are declaring to us, that, that the apostle John is declaring here is basically what it's saying. That God is light and in him is no darkness at all. And, and there's so much in that uh, when Jesus is talking about that. But, but let's go on. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. See, the Apostle John is reiterating here, if we obey him, if, we, if we're obedient to him, that means we're following him. That means we're just focused on doing what Jesus says to do, that seeking him. We're not looking to seek our things, or, and we're putting down those things that, that draw us away from him, and, and just in obedience, following him. And, and in so doing, that's how we walk in the light as he is in the light. That's how we keep from walking in darkness um, and, and being liars, basically. So this is where it must be clear. If the Lord does not do a work in us, giving us a new heart, that, that's walking in the light, right? Where we have a new heart, we want to do that. But if not, we'll only be filled with darkness. Now consider what Jeremiah chapter 17, verses 7 through 10 says. And I think this is interesting for us to keep this in mind. It says, Blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord and whose hope is in the Lord. For he shall be like a tree planted by the waters, which spreads out its roots by the river, 
and will not fear when heat comes, but its leaf will be green and will not be anxious in the year of drought, nor will cease from yielding fruit. So up to that point right there, man, that's blessed. That That's a good word. Yes and amen to that. Praise God for that. But now look what verse uh, 9 says uh, in, in this context. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? And verse 10 says, I, the Lord, search the heart. I test the mind, even to give every man according to his ways, according to the fruit of his doings. The fruit of our doings is what we practice, what who we seek. If we seek him and we practice obeying him, following him, we practice obeying him by taking in his word and, and uh, living the way he says and, and seeking him. Or are we going to practice our selfish nature and doing things our way? Uh, so these are some things to consider and, and to think about, to, to put at the in our hearts here. So here's something that we should uh, also that I, w- I want to uh, point out here, looking at this verse here in Jeremiah. First, this is under an old covenant context. This is before the Holy Spirit's been poured out on the believers, right? At, at this time that Jeremiah is prophesying, he's prophesying filled by the Spirit of God. But believers in the Old Testament did not have the Holy Spirit the way New Testament saints have the Holy Spirit poured out as the uh, prophet Joel uh, uh, spoke and came to pass in Acts chapter 2 on the day of Pentecost. So New Testament saints have a more glorious ministry that we receive because of Christ's righteousness on us through the cross, because of the cross uh, and believing in faith on Christ Jesus. Let me read 2 Corinthians chapter 3. Verses 7 through 11. But if the ministry of death, written and engraved on stones, was glorious, so that the children of Israel could not look steadily at the face of Moses because of the glory of his countenance, which glory was passing away, how will the ministry of the Spirit not be more glorious? For if the ministry of condemnation had glory, the ministry of righteousness exceeds much more in glory. For even what was made glorious had no glory in this respect because of the glory that excels. For if what is passing away was glorious, what remains is much more glorious. What we have as New Testament saints uh, is much more glorious. It's better than what the Old Testament saints had. So uh, God in Christ, he's changing our hearts. Our hearts are being changed by the the. We've been born again, and and we don't grow old in the spirit any longer, but we're being renewed and we're growing in him. There's a newness of life that we have now, not the old man of sin, and and, and, uh, that's been put to death, but we're growing now in, in newness of life, the new man, Christ Jesus. Now, another thing I'd like you to consider, as New Testament saints, we have been given a new heart. What was prophesied about in Ezekiel has come to pass in Christ Jesus. Just as Joel prophesied about the Holy Spirit being poured out, Ezekiel prophesied about God giving us a new heart, and that new heart has come through Christ. Ezekiel 11, chapter 19 says, Then I will give them one heart, and I will put a new spirit within them, and take the stony heart out of their flesh, and give them a heart of flesh. So, that in conjunction with Jer- with what Jeremiah is saying when he says the heart is evil is wicked above all things who can know it that was the stony heart that was the hardened heart that Ezekiel is referring to here God has given us in Christ has given us a new heart a brand new heart and and uh, newness of thinking Ezekiel thirty six twenty six says I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you I will take the heart of stone out of your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and you will keep my judgments and do them. Amen. That's That should be exciting for us as believers in Christ. This is an Old Testament prophetic word, but this applies to us today. It's a promise for us today in Christ that God has put a new heart, a new spirit, his spirit in us a new heart in us because his spirit lives in us and we will walk according to his statutes, according to his ways and uh, and we will keep them and do them. Obedience, this is following him. Jesus has done all the work on the cross, church, but it's for us as a child of God to obey him, to follow him, to discipline our hearts 
in, in the word and, and seeking him in prayer and, and uh, loving him and loving each other. So Jesus gave us this new heart when we were born again. John 3.3 3 says this, Jesus answered and said to him, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And then in verse 6 of chapter 3, That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. So Jesus is making this clear. The new heart that comes from being born again, and we're born again by the Spirit. The Holy Spirit is in part of that process of being born again. We believe and we're made new by the Holy Spirit doing his work uh, manifesting in us. And this is how we practice or walk in the light as he is in the light. Being led by the Spirit, you're going to walk in the light. And that's going to make your eye good, as Jesus was talking about. It's it's not necessarily, you could, be, uh, you could have poor vision physically, but still be full of the light and your eye is good, right? That doesn't mean that your eye is bad because you have poor vision, but he's, he's talking about what is going on inside the heart and the transformation that's taking place uh, in the life of, uh, of a Christian, of a believer, of a child of God. So um, John 3.20 says, For everyone practicing evil hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his deeds should be exposed. But he who does the truth comes to the light. Yet if you obey Jesus, you follow Jesus, you follow his word, you come to the light that his deeds may be clearly seen that they have been done in God. So Jesus is also wanting us to see that we need to be aware that, that we can deceive ourselves. And, and he's warning us, like, don't be deceived. John said that as well. If, if you say you walk in light, but you, you don't practice those things, right? You walk in darkness and you're a liar. So we need to come into the light. Uh, uh, we need to, uh, this is a daily coming into the light, coming before his presence. Lord, fill me today with your presence. And the Holy Spirit is with us always, church, right? Don't, don't mistake that. But it is, it's coming to him. It's, it's filling our heart and mind with him, with his word, uh, uh, and, and meditating on his word throughout the day. It may just be a small nugget that you're just chewing on um, the word of God, but that's what's uh, transforming our heart and making him our treasure where we're treasuring him, where we're saying, God, thank you that you've saved me. Thank you that you've delivered me. Thank you that you've had mercy upon me. Thank you that you're so good to me. Thank you that you've, you're my provider. Thank you for my family. Thank you for my friends. Thank you for uh, my church. Thank you for all these things that you've done. Thank you for where, where I live. Thank you for all these things, God, that you are working. And it's not a complaining heart, but it is a joyful heart. And it's because we, are, we treasure him. Because we know ultimately that he is the, our provider. He is our source. He's the one that we look to. He's the one that our confidence is in, that our trust is in. Again, going back to Proverbs, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding, right? But in all your ways, acknowledge him. And he's the one that's going to direct your path. So we got to come into the light. We've got to have this place. If we do not make seeking him an intentionality in our lives, in your daily life, you know, that process of going, I need to feed on the word. I need to spend some time with Jesus. That's an intentionality. You're being intentional about that, right? You're not just saying, yeah, it's good that I should go spend some time with the word. But you're not intentionally doing that. You're not taking that time out. You're saying, okay, you know, for some of you, it might be, okay, I got from this time to this time. That's going to be my Jesus time. That's going to be my, you know, my time with the Lord. And, uh, you know, for me, I like to get my coffee out and get the Bible out and, you know, I got my notes and spend that time with him. Whatever works for you. Maybe you're fasting. We talked about fasting last week. Maybe that's what's going on. <laughs> but uh, so th th we have to have intentionality in our lives in doing this and so that we can seek the Lord, hear his voice, uh, that still small voice. And, and uh, if our eye is bad, we're going to view life from a self-focused perspective. You know, it's going to be all self-referential. You're just going to be looking at yourself. What can I get out of it? Or what's going to happen to me? And how am I going to get through this? And what's going to, woe is me, anxieties, fears, all those things mount up um, when your eye is bad. That's, that's the truth of it. So Jesus is telling us that we are to have one heart with him. And this is what he's praying for us as described in John 17. In verse 21, it says this, 
that they may all be one, just as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. So in that, we are to understand that we're to be one with the Lord as well. We are one with the Lord, but we're to be one heart. If we're one with him, that means our heart is joined to his, that our heart is one with him, and that we're not going to uh, be desiring things that... that uh, are going to draw us away from him. We're going to want to come closer to those things that are uh, of him because he is the light and we're drawn to the light. We, we bring ourselves, we want to come into the light. We don't want to be in darkness, hiding and, and uh, in, in ignorance. So Jesus says this though, he breaks it all down. And he says, you cannot serve two masters. When you're wanting to come into the light, you don't want to have anything to do with the darkness. And it's the same on the adverse. If you're wanting to spend time in darkness, you don't want to come into the light. You don't want to have anything to do with those things. And, and you're going to feel shame and guilt and condemnation is going to be heaped on you. Um, and that's from staying in the darkness. You come into the light, all that falls off because you find the, the, the goodness of God, the love of the Father, and how uh, it's his kindness that leads us to repentance. It's his kindness. It's not his condemnation. God is not a condemner, right? That's not what we condemn ourselves because of our own sin, right? It's been said, we send ourselves to hell. It's for us to believe or, or, or you know, strictly we send ourselves to, to um that place of where, you know, that separation from God, let me put it like that, sin separates us from God. And, and if we uh, live in that place and practice uh, lawlessness, all that does is separate us. And that doesn't bring us into God's presence. So Jesus says, you're not going to be able to serve uh, God and mammon. He's using this as an example. It's especially interesting how something like money can pervert our hearts. If he is not what we truly treasure, right? Money can, can pervert our hearts, can draw us away. It's like any lust, lust of the eyes, lust of the flesh, pride of life. Uh, it, it can fall into all of those uh, places. And so Jesus, uh, in his great wisdom, is using this to help us see that and how it can draw us away. Uh, and, and especially if it is what is truly treasured in the heart. Many have tried and failed to serve both God and money. There is no hiding it, and it will be exposed. Does this mean God wants you poor in order to please him? No. You know, there's people that take a, a vow of poverty and all. Oh, this is the way you're truly going to be close to God. That's false. That, that's not a uh, proper understanding of God's word. That's a poor theology. That's a poor way of seeing God. God's rich, right? But that's not looking to be rich in this life. It's looking to be rich towards God in this life, seeking him. Because what will happen is if we put a, a love of money, if we put a, our love on money, Jesus says that's the root of all evil. That's what draws us away from him because we're looking to money to be our provider. And, and there's no faith in that. That's all works. That's all flesh. Uh, if you're you know living a life just to chase after that dollar to chase after making more money and you make money and you want to make more money and all those things and you lose sight of where God falls in the mix of all that if he's the provider of everything is his in the first place and if he's the one that gives you power to get wealth then what are we doing if we're trying to get wealth on our own or in our own strength and and honestly I'm talking honestly people can make excuses well I'm trying to get money for the Lord are you really are you really trying to do that is that really what's happening uh, I'd say many times uh, uh, when that is going on, people are usually caught up in the love of money. It, it, it can happen, right? It, 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 it can be. You can have somebody that's, you know, they're working. They're working hard for the Lord and, and all of their, they live off of, you know, 10% of their income and 90% of their income goes to the kingdom. God bless them, right? That They're, they're like uh, Barnabas. They're a son of encouragement. They're a blessing. And praise God for that. But that's typically not how it goes. And that's why Jesus is addressing this here. So Jesus says, uh, it's the love of money, again, that is the root of all evil. Uh, because it becomes your master. Uh, money is just a tool that you use to do what needs to be done. But it cannot become your God. It, you cannot become slave to it. And that's... Uh, uh, as the love of money grows, 
That's what happens. It's that's because you treasure that. Money is not to master us. Mammon, though it's not alive, will become a god in the lives of the people who worship it. And by worshiping it, I mean they're consumed by it. They're they're always thinking about finances and money and and how they can attain more. Right? And it's not about, well, how can I bless others? Right? How can I be a blessing? When God gives you finances, he's doing that to, so that you can be a blessing to others, so that you can be an, a stream of blessing to those around you. To you know, It's good to give to the poor. It's good to help others in need. It's good to, to give to the church, to tithe and, and offerings and all those things. Right, And I, I might be saying that, as I'm saying that, I might be, you know, making you feel a little anxious in that, right? And and if that's the case, then you really need to ask, okay, well, where is my treasure? Is my If my treasure is Jesus, then I'm going to want to do as he did. And, and uh, God's a giver. He's not a taker. God is a giver. And, you know, as, you, as we give in, in generosity, we're exemplifying him. And God doesn't forget. He doesn't, uh, it's not that he doesn't see when you give. He brings a reward. And, and you will see it openly as we've talked about before. But the love of money will enslave and the love of money does seek to be master over everything. As a child of God, you're not called to be enslaved again. Let's look at Galatians chapter four, verse seven, where it says, therefore you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. Galatians 5, one says this, stand fast therefore in the liberty by which Christ has made us free and do not be entangled again with the yoke of bondage. So though both of these passages are referring to works or our freedom being, you know, uh, uh, freedom coming not by our works, but by faith in Christ Jesus, uh, the principle does remain the same or it does apply here because Christ purchased you and I by his blood. His blood is priceless. And though we are his servants, we're also sons and daughters. We're his children. Christ died to make you free. Yet the love of money has the power to make you hate God. It'll Because what it does is it draws you into darkness. It can also take away your faith. When you have the love of money, there's no longer faith in God. You're not trusting in the Lord to provide. You're, you're trusting in yourself. How am I going to make money? How am I going to increase? What do I need to do to get more? I got to do this and I got to do that. And I got to go here and go make this happen and make this connection and use this person, uh, jump on that person to get over this and make all these things. And now you're doing all of this in your flesh rather than just trusting the Lord. Lord, I trust you. And, and if I trust you and I don't lean on my own understanding, but in all my ways acknowledge you, you're going to direct my path. You're going to bring the blessing. You're going to provide. You're going to do what you want to do. Your will is going to be done, and I will be blessed in your will because it's good and acceptable and perfect, as Romans 12 two tells us. Um, the love of money can send you down a path of double-mindedness. James 1, 6-8 says, But let him ask in faith with no doubting, for he who doubts is like a wave of the sea driven and tossed by the wind. For let not that man suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. It can quench your love for God and for man. Any type of slavery is bondage. Galatians 5, 13-15 says, For you, brethren, have been called to liberty. Only do not use liberty as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. For all the law is fulfilled in one word, even in this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. But if you bite and devour one another, beware lest you be consumed by one another. And money can do that. How many people are driven apart because of money? How many people, how many family relationships, church relationships are broken apart because of the love of money? And this should not be so. This should not be a part of God's church should not be attached to God's people. This is not what we're called to be. As free, we are called to use our freedom to serve one another in the body of Christ. So in the conclusion of this, Jesus is telling us if we want to have abundant life, we want to have real life as he uh, intended, what he brought, it's not going to come by earthly riches. That's not what's going to make you have life. You know, you, you, you may... Uh, 
You could win the lottery and you think, oh man, I've got it now. Life is great. It's, it's never going to be bad. It's always going to be good. False. Because your hope is in money. Your trust is in money. It, it's going to be gone. It, it comes and goes. That's why our trust it should be on the firm foundation of Christ and he as our provider. Right? Ask anyone who has wealth. If you ever meet somebody that's really wealthy, I, 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 they're usually their mind is so focused on money that they, they don't have the time to enjoy it. If they're honest with you, they will tell you it comes with sorrows that weren't initially expected. Ecclesiastes 5.10, wise man, wise man, Solomon, uh, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, writes this. He who loves silver will not be satisfied with silver, nor he who loves abundance with increase. This is also vanity. Basically, he's saying he who loves money will not be satisfied with money. If you love money, you're not going to be satisfied. You're always going to be wanting more. You're always going to be continuing to seek it. How do you increase it? How do we get more? Because you're losing it and you want more. As Paul says in 1 Timothy 6, verses 6 through 10, Here's some great wisdom for us. Now, godliness with contentment is great gain. You can't buy that. Uh, you, you, you know, this is something. You, if you have godliness with contentment, that is great gain. That, that's joy and peace. That, that's the spirit of God. That's the fullness of the spirit there. He says, for we brought nothing into this world, and it's certain we can carry nothing out. And having food and clothing with these, we shall be content. But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation and a snare and into many foolish and harmful lusts which drown men in destruction and perdition for the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil for which some have strayed from the faith in their greediness and pierced themselves through with many sorrows for the child of god if we desire to seek him first with a new heart rich towards god he calls us to live a different life and contentment in god is what we will see in the end that truly satisfies. So I hope that uh, this brings encouragement to you um, and, and should challenge as well, something to consider, something to ponder. And I pray that the Spirit of God um, would give you wisdom and teach you in all these things that you'll seek out God's Word and, and help you in your growing in Christ. God bless you. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, we uh, invite you this Sunday, 1015, we'll be uh, having Sunday service. Pastor Glenn Whitaker is going to be preaching this Sunday, so you don't want to miss that. Uh, doors open at 10 a.m., and then we'll be back here again next week uh, for our Growing in Christ study. We love you. God bless you. Thanks again for joining us. Mm -hmm.